tempest is raging, the billows are tossing high. The skies are showered with blackness, no shelter or help is nigh. Care is out now that we perish, how can thou lie and sing? When each moment so madly is threatening, a grave in the angry deep. The winds and the winds shall obey thy will. someone was pranking me. I haven't had anyone hide my Bible for quite a while before service, so I thought we kicked out all the pranksters. Isn't it wonderful that God is in control of the storm? Amen. I don't know if you've ever read carefully that passage of Scripture, but when Jesus commanded the winds and the waves and He said, Peace be still, the Bible says immediately there was a calm. When you look at a storm like Irma, like we had just a couple of months, or really a month ago, and you see the raging and the tempest and the destruction of it, it's kind of surreal afterward to come along when the water's calm and just see where there's been such a fierce, such a terrible <coughs> destruction, and then all of a sudden now there's a calm. It's just a real surreal feeling. But I can't imagine what it would have been to be in a boat that literally was going to go under. They were going to sink. And Jesus stands up and says, Peace! Be still! And immediately the winds and the waves obey. I mean, they just, it wasn't like, you know, they subsided. Immediately. It was calm. 
what a contrast. I want to remind you that God is always in control. There's no circumstance, there's no tempest in your life that God is not aware of or that God cannot simply command the still, the calm to come. If God allows a tempest in your life, I want you to know that God's the one that's allowing it. He has a purpose in it. It's wonderful to know I don't even need calm, I just need to know the master of the winds and the waves. We want to talk about him today. We're in Matthew chapter 4. And this is when Jesus' ministry, his physical earthly ministry began. That's in verse 17 of Matthew. The Bible says from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then we'll read verse 18 through uh, 22. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they are fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Je Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their shit nets, and he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Father, I pray that today as we look at the message that you preached and at the call to discipleship, that you will grant to us understanding of the spiritual truths we'll see for the next several weeks. We ask your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a couple of important things to point out, but I think that I mentioned most of the ones last week about the aspect of the passage of Scripture that we're, that we're beginning to study. When you study the Gospels, you always need to understand the context of what's being taught in those places. And in the next couple of weeks, we're actually going to look at Jesus teaching His disciples. And really, He's commissioning them. He's giving them, just like a person who's been newly hired, for a task, he's giving them their introduction. He is orienting them. It's really like a discipleship orientation class, if you could understand it along those lines. And we'll look at that in the next several weeks, but it's important to point out simply because sometimes believers think that everything Jesus said was how to get to heaven. And Jesus, when he's talking to his disciples, isn't explaining to them how they're able to get to heaven. He's teaching them how to be disciples. And friend, you and I, I believe, ought to fit in the, into the category of disciples, isn't it so? But I want to remind you about something just to think on uh, as you, if you're studying this passage of Scripture while we preach it. Uh, as, you st as you study it this week, think along the lines of this. Judas was a disciple. Judas was a disciple, but Judas wasn't a believer. Judas was a disciple, but Judas was not a believer. And so understand when we look at the requirements for discipleship, the difference between one believing in Jesus and having eternal life and one being a disciple. You could be a disciple, and you could literally be following the teachings of our Savior, and yet at the same time not even be a believer in Jesus. Being a believer is what is required for eternal life, for salvation. And so please don't confuse the two. Don't confuse the two issues, the two aspects, being a believer and being a disciple. Discipleship is not salvation. Believing in Jesus is how you receive salvation. Okay, but I want to look in verse 17, and of course we should remind ourselves of a little bit of our context. In verse 12, we see that Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison. So, John the Baptist is who we're referring to, and we know that we were really introduced to Jesus by John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the individual that God used to proclaim or foretell the way of the Lord. He was that that uh, Elias, Elias, that prophet, that was going to foretell that the, the Son of Man is here. And indeed, John the Baptist's message was the same as we see Jesus preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was John the Baptist's message. And John the Baptist is the one who God had told, the person that you see the Spirit of God descending on, he's the one. 
He's that same Jesus. And so John baptized Jesus. Why did God John baptize Jesus? We saw a couple weeks ago. Because it was the will of the Father. Jesus was surrendering to His own death, burial, and resurrection. He was identifying with the death that He died and with the resurrection uh, that would follow His death. And when Jesus did that, then we saw that He was filled with the Spirit. Somebody tell me, why is it so significant, significant that Jesus had the Spirit of God descend on Him? Why is that significant? Because it was an example for us. See, Jesus is God. Jesus, as God, wasn't tempted to succumb to sin, which is against God. He wasn't tempted to sin against Himself. Do you understand that? Uh, Jesus, as God, was not limited in His ability to do supernatural things. He could do supernatural things because He was God. But Jesus was filled with God's Spirit and worked and worked through the power and the influence, the leading of God's Spirit for an example to you and I who aren't God. And you and I who cannot do the things that God can do. And you and I who need God. And Jesus literally surrendered His ability as, as God. Now, he was, all, he was God. It didn't change the fact of who He was, but He surrendered who He was and instead worked through the power of the Spirit that God gave Him. For an example to us. And Christian, it's an example that says you can make it. You don't have a reason why you could say, well, sure, but that was Jesus. He was God. No, the Bible says that He was an example for us. He was in the likeness of sinful flesh without sin. He's an example of how a person with flesh can live without sin. He was an example how a person without power can have power not his own. And that's so significant. So I want to tell you, if as a believer you've never personalized the example of Christ being filled with the Spirit of God, you're missing an important spiritual step. There's an important <laughs> spiritual concept here that if you don't understand, you're just missing out on something so, so vital to spiritual victory and spiritual power. Jesus was empowered not because He needed to be, but because He was demonstrating to us how that we could be empowered by the same Spirit of God. Friend, you can't keep the law. You can't keep the law. You don't even know the law well enough to keep it. You're not even educated enough to keep the law. And I'm not picking on your education or lack thereof. I'm just telling you, uh, there are things that you do all the time that are against God's law and you don't even know it. Because you don't know the law well enough. You can't keep the law. And Jesus said, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And when He fulfilled the law, friend, He did so, how? The help of God's Spirit. We need God. We need God's power in our lives. We need, as a church, to be powerful, not powerless. We do not need to be powerful so that people can look on us and be impressed by the performance, but so that we can make it. So we can do what God's called us to do. So we can have victory. So that we can perform the tasks that God wants us to perform. We need God's power. Christian, you're trying to make it in your own strength. It's an attempt at futility. You're trying to do something which cannot be done. We need God's power. Jesus was an example for that. Then Jesus, after He was tempted, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and there He was tempted by the devil. And we know that He overcame that temptation and rebuked the Satan with the Scripture. And then we get into our text today, and we really are not going to take very long on today's message. It's a very simple message. First of all, I just want to just go through the passage and see what Jesus taught. If we're going to learn discipleship, and that's what this series is becoming about. We're looking at the example of Jesus, and in every instance where we see Christ's example, or we see what Jesus said, or what Jesus did, we see that people believed and people believed not. That's the theme that we'll find. But now we're looking at specifically the theme of being a disciple of the Lord Jesus. I wonder, I wonder what the reality for each of us is as it regards to being a disciple of Jesus. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, Jesus is real. You believe that, don't you? 
He's with God in heaven. You believe that, don't you? Jesus is Christ in us. In other words, the Holy Spirit has the ministry of being for us what Jesus was to His disciples. But the question is, are you as aware of your discipleship responsibility as you would be if Jesus were bodily here? In other words, is the reality of Christ in you as same, the same as the reality of Christ beside you? It's an important question, isn't it? Do you live with Jesus in you the same as you would live if Jesus was near you? And I fear too often, my friend, that we are so unaware, we have so quenched the Spirit of Christ in us that being in us is less of a reality than being near us. Think of that, will you please? When Jesus said to His disciples that it's expedient for you that I go away, He's really talking about the superior aspect of having Christ in them instead of Christ accessible to them. You see what I'm saying? Don't let the words distract you. Get the concept. In other words, having a person bodily, physically accessible, where you could go into the room where Jesus is, or you could be sitting near where Jesus is, or you could be in the same town where Jesus is, is a lot less significant than having Jesus living in you and never leaving. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. That's significant, isn't it? I'm just asking the practical question with regard to your discipleship and your awareness of Christ in you. What's more real? What would affect your life more, Jesus in you or Jesus in the same town? And I fear for some of us, we're so concerned about the externals that an external presence would mean more to us than it would having Jesus internal, Jesus in us. Do you care about Jesus? Do you care what Jesus thinks? He's in you. He lives in you. We ought to have a heightened awareness of that. It's one of the truths that we ought to recognize when we see the example of the indwelling Spirit of God. It ought to affect us for discipleship. Oh, it's so easy, isn't it? To silence Jesus. And you think, oh, I would never say that to Jesus. I would never say that around Jesus. I would never think that around Jesus, and yet He's in us. We're so guilty sometimes of just overlooking apparent truth. And I hope it's a help as we study discipleship. I hope it's a help to realize that those disciples then who followed Jesus had less at that time with regard to access than you and I have. They had less than you and I have. We don't think that way very often, do we? But it's true. It's what the Scripture teaches. So, what was the message Jesus preached? Verse 17, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I would like to preach, but at another time, a message on the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? What is it? Uh, it's not the kingdom of the Jews that Jesus is referring to right now. They're looking for the kingdom. That kingdom where the Jews rule the world. Where the Jews and their Messiah literally set up an earthly kingdom. This is the kingdom of heaven. It's not the kingdom of earth, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I want to I want to just break that down just briefly, just a little bit. Would you go with me, if you'll indulge me, to Luke chapter 16. I just want to look at something that will help us to comprehend the significance of the kingdom of heaven being at hand. Luke chapter 16. And I want to go to the passage of Scripture where we see actually the... Um, we actually see Lazarus and uh, the, the rich man. And we know the story of it. Well, let's just read the story of it, just in case some people here would either not be familiar with it or would not worry, know where it is in Scripture. You know, sometimes we assume things, and I don't want to assume familiarity with this passage of Scripture because there may be some details in it that even in reading it would be a help to us. So look down with me, if you will, to verse 19 of Luke 16. The Bible says, There was a certain rich man 
which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Matt Downs, uh, one of the evangelists that preaches at the ranch quite a lot, uh, he, he likes to use the word sumptuous. And he says, you know, most of us, we don't understand the word sumptuously. Uh, sumptuously is described by this man. He's, he's clothed in purple and fine linen. He's got nice clothes on. So he's kind of like, Anthony, stand up real quick. Uh, well, the Bible doesn't say. Okay, look at, uh, button, your, button your suit, the top button. How's this guy look? He looks pretty good, doesn't he? Fine linen. Okay. Uh, Mr. Taz works at an expensive suit place, and he got several of the teenagers' uh, suits. And Anthony, Anthony is just like, he looks like a model, man. He just looks, he looks executive, doesn't he? Oh, you can sit back down, Anthony. And... Uh, that's probably, I don't know, it's probably a thousand dollar suit, isn't it, Taj, that he's wearing? Yeah, yeah it's an eight hundred to a thousand dollar suit. How many of you guys here are wearing a suit that costs you eight hundred dollars? No, Anthony is. That's who is. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> he's our rich man. Now, you know where you're going to end up being rich here, don't you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, where's our Lazarus? <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, the idea is he's wearing nice threads, purple and fine linen. Now, purple, you know, Mr. Taj would appreciate, but no one else would quite the same way. He drives a purple car. He has a purple shirt, wears a purple tie. And that's just not for me. But purple, uh, for in this uh, genre or this, uh, in the oh, you got a purple Bible, don't you, Daniel? All right. So there's there's some purple people here. There's actually several people wearing purple. I've got to be careful not to bash purple here, uh, for particularly not for ladies. I think it's a wonderful color for ladies. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> purple is sort of a uh, royalty color. As uh, you know, he denoted royalty. So this man is wearing nice threads, nice linen, and purple, and he fared sumptuously. In other words, fair would be the food that he'd eat, and he ate pretty good. Now, I don't know what sumptuous fare for you is. It's kind of like what I eat pretty normally, <laughs> actually. Uh, I eat pretty good, and the reason why is because, uh, one, I'm just grateful for what I eat. You may look at what I eat and say, oh, it's no good. But I, you know, I do a lot of my own cooking, and I cook it like I like it, and I eat it. I fare sumptuously. This rich man, you know, he fared sumptuously. Okay, so if I were going to have uh, some of the men over in our church, and we were going to have, like, good food. We've done this before, haven't we, Tony? Like, we're just like, let's get some great food. Iguana. Yeah, we've had... Yeah, we've had some snake. iguana, some steak, snake. some lobster, some deer. snake, some deer, some, I mean, some just, some of y'all are looking like, ugh. Well, we rename our food sometimes. It's probably not quite as much what you think. But, you know, I like seafood. And uh, I like good quality seafood. There's nothing like uh, fresh fish, like fresh snapper. I'm not talking fresh like you bought it at the store. I'm talking like fresh <laughs> like you took it off the fish and he was flopping while you took it from him, you know, <laughs> fresh fish. And uh, lobster, you know, I, I appreciate lobster. Some people don't, but I like it. I like shrimp as well as lobster, to be quite honest with you. And a good colossal king crab, I don't get to eat that much. That stuff's too expensive. But you get a big old leg, about that big around, a king crab leg, and we cook some of that. would be fair and sumptuous, wouldn't we? And so Brother Matt at, uh, at the ranch tells our teenagers, you know, People ask you, sup, and you're like, I'm sumptuous, man. It means I'm, I'm eating good. I'm wearing nice clothes. I'm living with the finest. I have the finest. So I've got a suit like Anthony does, and I've got uh, food like Pastor does and Tony. And, uh, you know, I'm just, it's just there's no, no luxury that's not afforded me. I'm sumptuous. Okay, so the Bible says the rich man, he fared, by the way, you're not, this is Anthony, this is not the rich man. He's just wearing a rich man's suit. Okay, so uh, the, the rich man, the Bible said, there was a certain beggar in contrast in verse 20 named Lazarus, which was laid at his gates full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's, into Abraham's bosom. I'll stop there. Let's bring ourselves up to this point. So there's the poor man, and the poor man is looking for the scraps of the rich man. In other words, the rich man maybe, 
you know, he breaks something off and he leaves a little meat on the bone and he knocks it off the table. And the poor man is grabbing that and just trying to eat it. He's, he's not faring sumptuously, he's faring poorly, and he's faring only at the mercy of the rich man. What he eats is only as good as what the rich man discards. That's the idea. And there's a contrast in the way that they're living. Well, the Bible says that the poor man died and that he was carried, the angels carried him uh, to Abraham's bosom. And then the Bible says the rich man also died and was buried. So we see the angels took the poor man to Abraham's bosom. Uh, the rich man was buried and nobody took him anywhere. He went right to hell. In hell, the Bible says he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. And we know the example here. To Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted and thou art tormented. Beside all this, there is between you a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So Abraham said, you can't happen. You can't come to Abraham's bosom, and we can't go to hell. Can't come back and forth between the two. Can't happen. And then he goes on to talk about how the... His, this rich man's brethren had Moses and the prophets, same as he did. In other words, the rich man died knowing who God was, knowing what was required for eternal life. He fared sumptuously in his life. He did not need his, see his need for a Savior, and he died and went to hell. And Lazarus, who didn't have the finer things in life, had Moses and the prophets and received the message of Moses and the prophets and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now in a moment we'll be back in Matthew chapter 4 so you can start making your way there. But I want to ask the question about this passage of Scripture. How many of them made it to heaven out of the two men? How many? One. None of them did. None of them did. They went to Abraham's bosom. Go to Matthew chapter 4 and look at verse 17. Jesus, the Bible says... From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When people died before Jesus, where did they go? Paradise. They went to paradise or Abraham's bosom. That wasn't heaven. And now Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See the message of Jesus, what He's preaching? Now, this is not a new gospel. This is not a different gospel, but it's simply it is a next step. It's something that's new for everybody. What happened? Do you remember what happened when Jesus said, it is finished on the cross? What happened? The grave. The, the, okay, the temple veil was ripped in half, signifying that God's presence was not in the temple. What happened? The dead people raised up. The saints, the Bible said, the people that slept in Jesus, that is, those individuals that were in Abraham's bosom, came out of the grave. Why? To go to heaven. To go to heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus is preaching to people, saying what you've always hoped for is at hand. Now friend, if a person slept in Jesus, that is, a person slept, or they died, and they believed like Abraham did. Abraham believed God and his faith was counted to him for righteousness. They didn't go to hell. Faith was not different in the Old Testament or any different dispensation than it is today. Faith is believing God. But they didn't go to heaven. The kingdom of heaven is now at hand. you see this in the text this morning? There's a contrast. That is, the message Jesus is preaching is Everything you've ever wanted, everything you've ever waited for, it's here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus is preaching about the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, He's not preaching about the kingdom of Israel here. He's preaching about the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about God's economy. See, heaven's economy is different than ours, isn't it? It has been a verse that has just been going over and over in my mind, and I've had so many opportunities to share it lately. I have not seen, say it with me, I have not seen 
nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of a man the things that God hath prepared for them that love Him. That's heaven. The place where God is preparing a place for us. It's heaven. Okay. You know, my friend John Marino went to heaven a couple of weeks ago. He's Danny Marino's dad, for many of you know that know him. And uh, I went up to meet with him about three weeks ago. And uh, we just had a conversation. Just talked to him about when he was born again. and uh, Talked about, you know, the difficulty. He loved Loved living, didn't want to die. But we went over that verse, and I said, you know, I have not seen. I said, you, you can't imagine what heaven's like. You can't see, you've never seen anything that you could say heaven is like this. You've never seen anything like it. You can't think of words to describe what heaven is like because you've never heard anything like it. You can't imagine what heaven is like because your heart doesn't have the capabilities. As wild as your imagination may be, you can't imagine what heaven's like. That's how good it is. It's heaven. So for a person that's here and they think, I don't want to be separated from my loved one. I don't want to die. I don't want to... I don't, and, they, and they know Jesus as their Savior. One of the struggles for them is that they can't imagine. Can't imagine. I hate that song, I Can Only Imagine. You guys know what I'm talking about? Uh, it's a contemporary oh, song. Yeah. I hate it because yeah. it's contemporary, but I also hate it because you can't imagine, so it's a stupid song. I mean, the guy says, I can only imagine, and he talks about what he imagines heaven's like, and all I can tell you is, if you imagined it, it ain't like that. Your imagination can't attempt it. And I just, I, I'm sorry, if that's like your favorite song, and I just ruined your life. <laughs> I'm sorry Get a new song. about that. But it's just a terrible song, because it's doctrinally so, and it's, it's like most contemporary songs. It is uh, man-made theology. It's just like a guy has a concept and he imagines something about God and he, and he creates his own worship of God based on who God is to him, but he never checks his theology with the Scripture. And that, that song just doesn't check. I, I'm sorry I ruined it for you guys. It's garbage. But uh, you can't imagine what heaven's like. can't imagine. The Bible says so. If you think the Bible's wrong, I think you're wrong. Uh, it's just, it's not, it isn't so. It isn't possible. So that's the message Jesus is preaching. He's saying, okay, your loved ones which slept, which are in Abraham's bosom, which are in a place called paradise. Now we can imagine paradise, can't we? We can go back to the description of the Garden of Eden and imagine paradise must be much like that. A place where there's an absence of sin, where God's presence certainly is. But see, sin had separated man from God... And those sacrifices were offered, they were not the sacrifice that had to be offered in order for that separation from God to be finally complete. That is the kingdom of heaven. See, today when you and I read the New Testament of the Scripture, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's the kingdom of heaven. Verse 18. The Bible says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon calling Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Okay, so we saw the message that Jesus preached was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And now we're going to see the action that Jesus followed. The message he preached was about the kingdom of heaven. The action that Jesus followed or that he acted out was that he called disciples to follow him. And I just want to look at that briefly. The Bible says he saw two brethren, Simon Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. I like the description. You know, just in case you were wondering why the guys were casting the net into the sea, uh, I know, based on my personal experience, that there are people who are casting hooks into the water, but they've never caught fish and they don't hope to catch fish. And so these guys are fishermen. The idea of, for they were fishers, I believe, this is my personal belief, the reason it is described why they were casting a net into the sea was to let you know that these guys were successful. In other words, this is how they made their living. They weren't throwing their net into the sea because it was the weekend. They were going to try to see if they could catch fish like a real fisherman does. These were fishermen. That's what they did. And so then we see that these guys, Jesus said to them, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And so Jesus offered them, if you'll be my disciples, if you'll follow me, I'll make you superior fishermen. 
That's the idea. In other words, how successful were they as fishermen? Good enough to make a living. They were successful enough at fishing to make a living. <laughs> you know the old saying, give a man a fish and you can feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you'll feed him for life. Some people can't be taught. <laughs> and so they're just not successful. Now, there are people I don't want to go fishing with. Uh, you know, I'll take them fishing, but I don't want to go fishing with them. You know, I've been before with people that say, let's go fishing. I think, okay, maybe they know how to go fishing. And we go fishing, I'm like, okay, so what are we, what's, what's the method? How are we going to fish? Well, you know, I got this stuff. Well, you ever caught fish doing that? Uh, no. Like, I don't want to go fishing with somebody else. I don't want to fish with somebody that didn't know how to catch fish. These guys knew how to catch fish. But here's the deal with fishermen. I don't care if it was in that day when it was a mundane living that they made. A fisherman always wants to catch more and better fish, don't they? Anybody that's really caught fish, you know, when you go fishing, do you hope to catch small fish or big fish? Big fish, right? You say, well, if you're targeting a small species, if you're targeting a small species, do you want to catch a small one of that species or a big one? A big one. I want to catch the granddaddy. I want to catch the big mama fish. I want the biggest one when I go fishing. And that's the way fishermen are. So Jesus said to the disciples, follow me, successful fishermen who know how to catch fish, and I'll make you fishers of men. In other words, you won't be fishermen, you'll be fisher for men. On the surface, it's hard for me to imagine how that could be an appealing offer. Certainly not what I wish to do on my day off. On my day off. I'm an, in, I'm an extrovert. Or not extrovert, I'm an introvert. I'm sorry. I do understand the meaning of the word. I'm an introverted person. My wife will tell you. Ask my wife. She knows me better than anybody else. She'll tell me, yeah, my husband is an introvert. That's his personality. I'm an introverted personality. That is, if I had a choice between being around people... This is just for me, not, not for my ministry, but for me. If I had a choice between being around people or being alone, I'd choose being alone. If you gave me a knife and said, go out into the woods and survive, and I had to take someone with me besides my wife, or I had to go alone, and I got a choice. You know, I could take one of you guys to help me survive, or I could go try to survive by myself. If it's up to me, I'm going by myself. I'd rather go along. I'm an introvert. I'd rather be alone. Now, I like people. I like the ministry. And God has equipped me for the ministry which He has called me to. And so I'm always around people, actually, all the time. So when I take a vacation, my idea of a vacation is not, let's get on a cruise ship with a bunch of people. My idea of vacation is let's drive where there aren't any people and go there or whatever. You know, that's, you know, that's me. Okay, so on the surface... If you were to offer me as a successful fisherman the opportunity to fish for people, I'd say I just like the social habits of fish better than the social habits of men. The reality of it is, when you think it through it more clearly, they're being offered something a lot greater. Think of it in terms of this. Why is it we don't want to lead? Why is it we don't want to lead people? People that don't lead others. Why is it we don't want to lead? Could be a lot of reasons for it, but I think one of the reasons is just because it's hard to get people to follow. The toughest thing about leadership is fathership, followership. You try to lead people, it's tough to get them to follow. Isn't it? You think about it. I mean, they're fickle. They're not committed. It's just tough to get people to follow. And they're told, you're going to fish for men. That is, you're going to go after men. Ultimately, we know that we're talking about winning souls. Winning the souls of men. Leading them to Jesus. The Great Commission was, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things. So, go and teach, baptize, and then teach them how to observe or to follow the things that Jesus has taught you. Now, I'll tell you, that's a tough task. But let me ask you a question. What's the value of men versus the value of fish? There's no comparison. 
You eat fish, men are eternal. The value of men is so much greater. And friend, I will say to you that the call to discipleship is a call to set aside something that probably you're good at, you're successful at, you can even make a living at, but the call to discipleship is to invest in something of greater value. To try to harvest something that has greater value. When I think in terms of the vanity of life, it's easy to put this in perspective. Most of us, if you're an adult, not if you're kids, but most of us, if you're an adult, spend most of your time trying to survive. Don't you? I mean, you go to work, why? To get money. Why do you need money? For the kids, it's like so you can go to Burger King. No. Uh, so you can go on college days trip. Uh, so you can go to camp. So you can... No, the reason you need to get money is so that you can pay for your housing. So you can pay for your food. So you can support your family. So that you can uh, support your church. So that you can... Everybody has their reasons for getting money, don't they? But the, usually the reason for it is because you've got to pay the bills. And the truth of the matter is most of us are more occupied with that. What happens each month after you pay your rent? Comes back. You owe the next month's rent. Right? I mean, you can pay 12 months in advance and as soon as the 12 months is over, you'll have to pay the next 12 months. It's just a recurring thing. Uh, you may pay off your house and only have to pay Uncle Sam's taxes and maintenance and repairs, but you still got to pay for them. You just got to. You have to. You have to live somewhere, you have to eat something, and you have to survive somehow. And so most of us spend most of our lives surviving. Staying in the house for the month so you can pay for it next month. i pay for it this month, so I'll have it to pay for next month. Most of you eat so you can stay alive, so you can eat your next meal. And we just, we, we exist, and if we think about it in terms of, of the longevity of life, we can't even most of the time remember most of what we do in order just to make it through life. Why are we trying to make it through life? Why are we trying to make it through our lives? What? Okay, to get to Jesus. Well, what if you, okay, if you know Jesus as your Savior, though, if you know Jesus as your Savior, I mean, that's kind of done for you, isn't it? It's kind of taken care of. The reality of it is, is that there's a contrast in this call to discipleship that actually is every bit of as much of a call to us as it was to those disciples. This is not vocational. This is not where you would say, stop making a living and instead of that be my disciple. That's not really the idea here so much. You remember what happened after the resurrection, after Jesus ascended? Uh, I mean, before Jesus ascended? I go what fishing. The, the disciples said, I go fishing. They went back to fishing. It, was, it wasn't so much because they needed to make a living. It was because they didn't really have a purpose. And this call to discipleship, my friend, is a call to living with purpose. Did you hear me? If you're taking notes, the call to discipleship is a call to living with with purpose. See, before the purpose was fisher of fish. And a fisher of fish was fishing to catch fish for a food and so that he could trade the fish or sell the fish to make a living. So the purpose of fishing was survival. But the call to discipleship is to live with purpose. That is to fish for things that are eternal. 1 John, you ought, to, you ought to consider memorizing 1 John chapter 1 and 2 or just some verses of chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And then it goes on to explain that. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then it says, And the world passeth away in the lust thereof. So the idea is that if you love the things of the world or you invest in the things in the world, that is things in this life, the Bible says the world's going to pass. 
even the desire for the world's going to pass. So interesting, isn't it, how desires in life change? The things you wanted when you were a teenager are probably not the things that you want most when you're an adult. I mean, some of the things are the same for me. When I was 18 or 19 years old, with regard to things that pass away in this world, I was very interested in fast motorcycles and fast cars. I had a lot of interest in those two things. Uh, I spent a lot of time riding a motorcycle. I went to church. I worked in my youth group and all those things, but I rode a motorcycle to church. I rode a motorcycle to youth group. And I like to go fast on a motorcycle, and I always like to ride a faster motorcycle. I, never did. I didn't put too much money into it because I knew better. But if I could ride a friend's motorcycle as fast or another guy's motorcycle as fast, I never rode a motorcycle fast enough. I never did. I've ridden some motorcycles that go 200 mile an hour and they weren't fast enough. I'm not saying I went 200 mile an hour. I'm just telling you they couldn't get there quick enough. You always think, wow, that'd be really fast until you ride it. And you're like, well, if it's just a little faster, it'd be better. That's the way you think about things like that. And cars, too. I have, I still have my 1971 Chevelle. And compared to the cars they're making now, actually it's kind of slow. But in its day, it was a fast car. And the way I built it, it was faster than it came from the factory. And that used to occupy some of my time, working on my fast car and riding a fast motorcycle. There came a point in life, though, when, I'll be honest with you, stopping suddenly was more my concern than going fast. In other words, I was afraid I'd be going too fast on a motorcycle and come to a sudden stop. You know, so I stopped liking fast motorcycles so much. Too many people I knew got killed. And um, I guess I still like fast cars to some degree, but just I just don't enjoy it like I used to. The, the, you, you change. When you get further along in life, <laughs> my uh, great aunt, who passed away this last year, was 99 when they took her car. So she drove until right before she turned 100. And uh, my parents kept buying her cars. She wanted to have her car, and they decided that uh, when you have to take too much pain medicine to be able to drive, you probably shouldn't be driving. <laughs> so they took her car. I suppose, probably in my life, if I survive too long, that there will come a time when I won't even drive at all. I keep waiting on our teenagers to get cars, and instead of me picking them up, them picking me up. That's the way I would like it to be. And so I keep telling them every, every time I pick them up, I'm like, you know, pretty soon you're going to be driving, you'll be picking me up. And that'd be all right with me. You know, if I had somebody take me everywhere I wanted, I'd just soon not drive. When I was young, I didn't want anyone else to drive but me. I'm still scared to ride with anyone else, but I would rather... Now, I'll just as soon not drive if I feel safe riding with them. You change, don't you? The lust change, they pass away. The time's going to come when maybe I won't have the physical health to get in a car. I won't go anywhere. I won't want to go anywhere. And I sure won't want to go anywhere fast in a fast car or a fast motorcycle. Things change, don't they? And the day will come when none of the things that I used to like on this earth, and I've wasted too much time talking about it, but none of the things on this earth will have any kind of pleasure or enjoyment for me at all. I just won't want anything that this world has to offer. And when that day comes, my friend, the things that are eternal will still matter to me, probably more so than they ever have. Matter of fact, in this last year, every person I've talked to who is in the final days of their life has told me something like, I wish I'd valued, they didn't say it in these words, but they said, I wish I'd valued eternal things more in my life. I wish I hadn't spent so much time trying to pay bills, trying to make a living, trying to provide. I wish I'd spent more time doing the things that I'm about to enjoy in heaven or con being concerned about things that are going to be in heaven. Eternal matters. What are eternal matters? Men. The word here, men, means mankind. Men and ladies who have eternal souls. Friend, I'll just tell you, they're what matters. Somebody last week was talking to me about their unsafe family, and they were telling me, you know, I'm more comfortable around Christians than I am my family. I fit more, I belong more with Christians than my family. And we were talking about how important it is to win their lost family. 
because if they don't harvest, if they don't, if they don't fish successfully for the souls of their family, they'll be separated from their family forever. And that's a reality. So yet so many times, lost friends and lost family involve so much of our time and our focus. And the reality of it is, is that in heaven they won't be involved with that unless we win them. And when Jesus called the disciples, the message was He was preaching was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the focus of the message when He called His disciples was eternal souls are what you need to go for, what you need to fish for. And friend, that brings us to a very practical conclusion today. If the disciples of the Lord Jesus were better invested, if the better investment of their time was in the lives and souls of men, is the reality of that any different today? See, a call to discipleship is a higher calling, isn't it? Literally. It's a heavenly calling. It's a call to be invested. A call to value eternal things instead of temporary or temporal or worldly things. We're eternal. And so the things we value ought to be eternal. The way I've learned and the way I'm growing to see things that have to do with this world are this, is this way. God made us as stewards of this earth, didn't He? Of this world. There's pleasure, isn't there, in things in this life? Is there no pleasure in the things in this life? There certainly is. There, there, and, and if God made it that way, could there be an appropriate pleasure or zest, if you will call it that, for the things of this life? Could that be appropriate? Sure. Could a person enjoy fishing? Would it be sinful for a person to enjoy fishing? It could be. So then, is fishing sin? No, it's not. See, fishing would be sinful if that's what you live for. But you can enjoy fishing, couldn't you? You know, I've learned, I don't enjoy fishing by myself. I'm an introvert. I would love, for my sake, to go off into the Everglades alone. Me and the pythons and the alligators on a boat and try to catch fish or pythons or alligators. But I don't ever do that and I don't even want to anymore. If I'm going to go catch pythons, alligators, and fish, I'm going to take somebody with me. Daniel's like, me, me, let me go, I want to go. Uh, if I go fishing, I take someone with me. Why? Well, because I'm interested in more than fishing. I'm interested in men being a fisherman of men. You see it? Don't take that the wrong way. You guys. I want to fish for men. In other words, I want the souls of men. So if I take someone fishing, man, I'm, I'm always trying to find a lost guy to go fishing with. Right now, uh, the managers of the store next to my house, they're Muslim. They're nice people. And I'm taking them fishing sometime soon. We're going to go fishing. You know I want to take the Muslim people fishing? Because I want them to catch fish. And I want to catch fish, but I really want them to receive Jesus. And I want to have a chance to talk about Jesus. And it just provides a good atmosphere for it. Sports is a waste of time. Sports is a waste of time. I mean, literally, your time spent on sports is a waste of time. 80% of Americans are heavily involved in sports. 80% of Americans, you say, well, 80% of Americans are wasting their time. Yeah, so it makes a really good forum to reach people, actually. We practice with our teenagers for youth group. You know what we usually do in youth group? We usually play sports. 
They come to youth group, we preach to them, and then we play sports. You know why? Because they like sports. And it's a great time, to, a great way to get to spend time with teenagers is to play sports. Is there anything evil about sports? No. Is there anything evil about fishing? No. Are those things an end to themselves and others? Do I live for sports? Do I live for fishing? No, but I'm going to use those things to fish for men. In other words, it's important to people. And I can enjoy it. Unless you're an Atlanta fan, you could enjoy it, I think. It would be terrible if you weren't. I don't know. What, I'm sorry. This is like all day today, isn't it, Tosh? All week. It was yesterday. Did I pick on you yesterday? My whole life, really. Yeah, really. Whole life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the man can't help it. He's from Atlanta. But Charlie has Atlanta roots, and he, you know, he survives somehow. Anyway, uh, here's, here's the deal. Sports are important to people, and so you know what? I don't reject sports. Ah, there's no use. I'm not interested in that. But if, no, I don't reject it. Why? Because it's valuable to people, and it's an opportunity to fish for men. Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby and Joanne Fabrics are probably the, the biggest ripoffs in the world. <laughs> tell you, those places, Hobby Lobby and Joanne Fabrics, they're the nearest thing to my comprehension of what purgatory is. <laughs> like in my mind, my wife doesn't make me go to Hobby Lobby. I'll take her to Hobby Lobby and I'm allowed to sit in the car. I don't even have to go inside that place. Usually if she's going to go, or not Hobby Lobby, but the other place, Joanne Fabric, we have one local. You know, they get, they get like we just got that 50% off coupon for Christmas stuff. And I know my wife's going to go there. I didn't even throw the coupon away. She wasn't home yesterday. And I thought, I'm going to throw that away. I thought, no, that'd be me. So I went and put it on her on her uh, desk, the 50% off coupon to Joanne Fabrics. I hate that place. But there's people that like hobbies. They like Joanne Fabric places, you know, those kind of places where they people waste money on crafts that they're going to throw away. And you know something? That has value for people. So I could be involved in crafting. I probably will not. I could be involved in crafting for the sake of fishing for men. They have their place. So the call that Jesus is making with his disciples is not, don't ever fish. It's not, don't be interested in anything. The call is, change what you're targeting. Change your purpose. You're going to go to a sports event. Go there to reach people. You're going to go fishing. Fish to reach people. You're going to make crafts. Use your crafts to reach people. You're going to go to work and do whatever people do when they uh, follow their different career paths. Use it as a way to reach people. Just use those things in life as a forum to reach people. Why? Because of the reality of eternal life of eternal things and because of the vanity of temporary things. And that essentially is the message Jesus was preaching when He preached the kingdom of heaven. And that essentially is the call Jesus made when He called His disciples to follow Him. You following Jesus? Are we all the same? No, we got some sports fans. We got some fishermen. We even have golfers. Well, we don't have any golfers in here. Yeah, Mr. Todd's golfs too. Yeah, we have golfers. We have all kinds of things wrong in life. <laughs> and God's made all these things as a means for us to be disciples. Here's my question, Christian. If you were to define yourself, what would the description be? I'm a Miami Dolphins fan. I'm saying those words. I'm not saying those I'm saying those words like somebody could say them and mean them. I couldn't mean them. But I'm a Miami... Look at Charlie Green. I'm a Miami Dolphin fan. Okay. Um, how about... I'm a fisherman. I fish for men. And I use the dolphins. Being a do fan of the dolphins. Could you do that? Yeah, you could. You know what? I'm a fisherman. Could you do that and fish for men? could. I'm a crafts lady. I don't think crafts men are there. That's the kind of things you find at Sears, not uh, <laughs> at Joanne Fabrics. But I sew. 
I make quilts. I don't really, any more than I'm a dolphin swimmer. What for? I'm trying to win people. You can make a craft for somebody. Take it to them. You could, whatever. You can use what you do for the Lord Jesus Christ, and that needs to be your overwhelming purpose. What motivates you? Are you a disciple of Jesus? That's the real question. Jesus said to these disciples, follow me, and I'm asking you to give up something that's less for something that's more. Have you taken the thing that's worth less and given it for the thing that's worth more? However God leads you to do that, it becomes very practical at that point. The question is, are you a disciple? Father, I pray that you would help us as believers to understand there's a difference between being born again and being a follower, being a disciple. Or the difference is the focus. The focus on the kingdom of heaven versus the focus that has an end in this life. And I pray that you would help the clarity of that truth to ring in our minds, to sink to our hearts, and to affect the way we think so that we can live for you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In just a minute, we're going to have an invitation. And a couple of things in the invitation. First of all, last week I neglected... Uh, Rolando, in essence, were going to come forward to join the church last week, and I neglected to uh, go through the process or ask if anyone wanted to join the church. So that would be part of the invitation. If God's led you, and even if you haven't spoken to me about it in advance, if God's led you and you'd like to unite with this church uh, by becoming a member, and you haven't done that before, if the Lord's leading you to do that, that would be something you could respond to. That's one of the ways of being a disciple, plugging in to the local church and getting involved with the program where God is reaching the lost in that. If the Lord's led you to that, uh, you could respond by that way in the invitation. The, the message today was pretty simple. First of all, we talked about the kingdom of heaven. That's a concept that you're either included or excluded from on the basis of whether you receive Jesus as your Savior or not. If you don't know whether you're born again, you have eternal life today, the invitation is a time when we invite you, Brother Todd, standing in the back with his Bible, and he could open up and show you how you can know for sure you have eternal life. That's the invitation if you're not born again, if you don't know what that means this morning. And then the third part of the invitation is the call to discipleship. It may be that you've acknowledged the call, but you've never answered the call. And God's calling you to follow Him. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Have you answered the call to discipleship? We're going to ask our pianist uh, to play. Do you have a number that you're at there? No, not yet. Let's turn to page 242 then. You'll open up to page 242, and I'll ask everyone to stand. And uh, I just want to ask our pianist this morning, instead of us singing, she's going to play Jesus, I Come, and we'll just start off with the piano playing. And uh, while she plays, if God's spoken to you, you do business with it. If you need, uh, if you need to respond by uh, making sure about the matter of eternal life, you can see Brother Taj in the back. If you're here this morning and you need to answer the call of discipleship, it may be appropriate just to take a seat and do business with the Lord. But as our pianist begins to play, Jesus, I come. You respond. You do business with Him as the Lord leads. Folks are responding. If God's spoken to you, just do business with Him. God doesn't talk to us simply so we can hear Him. He speaks to us so that we can answer Him and say, Yes, Lord, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. That's what Jesus is saying to you.
Well, last week uh, I had spoken with Rolando in essence about joining the church, and they'd indicated they wanted to, and his aunt was actually here and her friend. And because of my blundering brain, I just completely forgot uh, to mention it during the invitation last week. So I apologize to you guys uh, for that. But I'm glad you still want to join our church. And uh, they, they belong here. They've been attending for some time, and they just they fit. I've talked, spoken with both of them, and they've shared their testimony of their salvation and, and that they both have been baptized after becoming believers. And so, uh, we of course, two things are required in order to become a church member. One, you have to be saved, and you have to follow uh, the Lord and believers' baptism. And the rest is really just a decision more that you make than we make when you make a decision to join a local group, to join our uh, church. Uh, we don't really vote for or against joining the church. I've been to churches that do that, but if God's led you here, we're just for it. And so we always vote for it. We don't vote against it. Uh, so we'll do that in just a minute. Would you like to share anything by way of testimony this morning? Would you rather just be silent and not have to go through it? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> I, you know, we should like have like a five-minute speech required. You know? <laughs> um, one of the things I would say on behalf of our church is we're so delighted that God's led you to us. We, you know, it's just it's just such a privilege that He's that He's brought you very special folks to be part of this family. We're looking forward to what God's going to do and the way that He's going to have you serve in this local church. So if you'd rejoice with them coming, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to dismiss with a word of prayer, and then once you come up and shake their hands and let them know how glad you are. Watch out for us, and she's a hugger. So <laughs> let them know uh, how glad uh, you are that, they, that they've come to be part of this local assembly. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the service we've had today. Thank you for this dear couple, Lord. And God, I just I ask that you would do things and use them in ways that are beyond what could even be imagined. We just thank you so much uh, for bringing them to us. And I pray that as a church, you'll help us to do right by them, both by way of fellowship as also by way of encouragement. And we just praise you for the great service we've had today. And we just ask that you go with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.